My name is Daryl Barnes and I want to do a custom review for the nerve system, an introduction to the nerve system. Remember that whatever your teacher wants you to master, that's what I want you to focus on. These are some concepts that I'm asking my students to focus on and I hope that this is helpful to you as well. The nerve system is what controls everything in your body and without your nerve system there's not a whole lot that's going to properly function. The heart has an inherent contractile rhythm, but most of, the, most of the processes in your body are somewhat dependent on a nerve system that is functioning. The central nerve system is the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nerve system is the stuff that connects the brain and spinal cord out to your body. Another concept that I want you to think about is that problems in the nerve system might be in the spine, but they can actually refer pain to other sites, all the way down your leg or all the way down your arm if you have a disc problem or swelling. I want to draw a picture for you for a minute, and it's kind of a simple reflex arc. So I want to start out and draw the spinal cord. There's the central canal. This is dorsal. This is ventral. And the nerve that brings information into the spinal cord, the dorsal nerve, is a sensory nerve, and it kind of looks like an octopus to me. It's a, it's a unipolar nerve, and I've recently heard these called pseudo-unipolar nerves. Anyhow, it is an afferent sensory nerve and it is carrying information in to the central nerve system. And once this information arrives, there may be an interneuron that connects to a motor neuron, which then goes back out to the periphery. Actually, I would kind of like to draw that a little bit different. I'd like to kind of draw it like this. And the reason I want to draw it like that is that once this nerve exits, this ventral nerve, it's going to merge and go back out the, the same way that sensory nerve came in. This is a motor nerve, and this is carrying uh, information to glands or to muscles to ask them to secrete or contract one or the other. We say afferent in efferent out, that's what we say, we say sensory in, motor out, and that's kind of something that helps us remember the organization of the nerves as they come into the spinal cord. This is a, basically a simple reflex arc. So from a practical application, if, if a reflex is attempted to be made and this tendon feels like it is being stretched beyond belief, then this information will come into the spinal cord and be automatically processed to shorten the muscle and that's what causes the contraction that results in a reflex. And if there's a problem any, anywhere along this pathway, if there's swelling or if there's a disc herniation, then that could inhibit the, the, at least the magnitude of the reflex. It might result in no reflex at all. This is called an interneuron. And notice that it connects the incoming and the outgoing information. Another thing to remember is that this sensory information actually eventually goes to the brain and it's in the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobes where sensory information first arrives and then the response, the motor response would be exiting from the precentral gyrus in the frontal lobe to go back out to the body to make some action in response to the incoming information. 
I think of the reason I'm balking right now is that it, this could be a withdrawal reflex. If you put your hand in a hot fire or on something hot and you withdraw it really fast, another nice example of a simple reflex art. Now remember, what we're learning too is a lot of times when information travels to or from the brain through the, sp through the spinal cord, it decussates, it crosses in the spinal cord. And so that helps us understand how that a person could have a stroke in one cerebral hemisphere, but drag the opposite limb. And that's kind of interesting. Not cool, but interesting. So the things that are controlled by this motor nerve are called effectors. The things that we voluntarily control are, this is called the somatic motor division and the autonomic nerve system is what works without us thinking about it. It's very nice that we can eat a hamburger and we don't have to think it all the way through our digestive system. We just have to deal with what our body is not really interested in keeping later. At a later time, we have to do that. Another thing that I would like to do is draw a motor neuron. Let's do that for just a minute. A picture is worth a thousand words. Let's do that. I like that idea. I'm going to draw a basic motor nerve. This part right here is the cell body. And I'm going to kind of draw these a little bit stylistically, draw these dendrites. But the part of a nerve that brings in information is the dendrite. And this means literally tree. The part that conducts the electrical signal down and away from the nerve cell body is called the axon. And then this is the synaptic knob. And this will probably interface with another nerve or another muscle, maybe in this case a muscle. We say that this side is presynaptic. And this side is postsynaptic. We also learned that calcium is important to diffuse into this synaptic knob to allow for the neurotransmitter to cross this cleft and open a, a sodium channel for depolarization in the postsynaptic membrane. So remember the acetylcholine, the main neurotransmitter that stimulates a muscle to action is acetylcholine. And we say that synapses are cholinergic if they are sensitive to acetylcholine. Let's go back to this side of the picture for just a minute because there's something else I, won't, I don't want to leave out. In the peripheral nerve system, there is oftentimes a, a Schwann cell that is wrapped around this axon and that insulates the axon and increases the conduction velocity. In the central nerve system, it is an oligodendrocyte. It looks kind of like an octopus and it slings this fatty sheath around numerous nerves within the central nerve system. Another thing that's kind of important in the anatomy is that these little spots are called nodes of Ranvier. It may be nodes of Ranvier, but somehow Ranvier sounds like music in my ears. What we know is that electrical conductions as they go down this axon will kind of skip from constriction to constriction and it results in saltatory conduction. When we have a a myelinated nerve, we're talking about something that's probably traveling 32 to 250 miles per hour. This one would be like a type B fiber from <coughs> viscera. This would be more like a, a sensory fiber. 
when there are fatty sheaths, when the diameter of the nerve is increased, it increases the conduction velocity. I'll continue along with my review and I'm going to probably come back and modify this just a little bit. We have learned that the incoming information arrives at the dendrites, then the cell body, and then continues down the axon. So that's kind of the basic order of nerve conduction along a multipolar neuron. This is like a bipolar neuron found especially in the eye. Pseudo unipolar is what, it's kind of a new term, but basically it's a, uh, a, a unipolar nerve in my mind. And it's the one that kind of has a little head in the middle that kind of looks like an octopus. And glial literally means glue. Astrocytes help repair damaged tissue. Oligodendrocytes help Insulate nerves to increase conduction spe speed. Microglial cells help scavenge. Uh, they're like phagocytic cells. And then lastly, ependymal cells are cells that secrete cerebrospinal fluid. And specifically, those are associated with the choroid plexus, plexuses in the ventricles. Remember this, that Schwann cells begin on the axon, axon and wrap outward. And then oligodendrocytes, which I'm talking about in the central nerve system, start wrapping out and then go inward. So it's kind of a, a opposite configuration. In the nerve system, if it's white matter, it means it's fat. If it's gray matter, it's usually a cell body or an unmyelinated nerve. If it's in the spinal cord, white tracks, oh, I'm just I'm revealing the answer in what I'm saying. White tissue is a track, an ascending or a descending track. Once again, if it's gray, then it means that it is a cell body because the cell body doesn't usually have the myelin sheath around it. It's the axon that is myelinated. Remember this. When we talk about an action potential, one of the key events is that we have sodium that goes in and then potassium is kicked out. And I think we learned that the resting membrane potential is about negative 70 millivolts in a nerve. And when sodium goes into the, uh, to the neuron, then it depolarizes and, and it causes a spike. And then as potassium is shipped back out to bring that back down to its resting membrane potential, the spike, the electrical signature goes back downward. And so an action potential in a nerve looks like this, goes up and down. The absolute refractory period is a period in time of a nerve in this cycle of nerve stimulation where no amount of other stimulation will cause another action potential occur, to occur. I talked earlier about saltatory conduction, how this electrical signal can jump from node to node all the way down. There is another type of conduction called continuous conduction that is associated with nerves that are unmyelinated. Unmyelinated nerves are like pain fibers, nociceptive fibers, and they usually will conduct at about one mile per hour, relatively steady. There are type A fibers, type B fibers, and type C fibers when we talk about axons. Remember that the type A fibers are myelinated 250 miles per hour. Type B fibers are also myelinated 32 miles per hour. These 32 mile per hour ones, from what I understand, are sensory fibers from internal body parts. Usually the type A fibers are picking up information from the periphery. Type C fibers are one to five miles per hour and they're unmyelinated and these are probably pain fibers, um, no susceptive fibers. <clears throat> so we talked already about a presynaptic and a postsynaptic sign. This is the cleft 
This is a synaptic cleft here, and this is the cleft across which neurotransmitters move, and then they will lock with the sodium channel on the other side and unlock that channel so that whatever is on this side, if it's a muscle, it'll cause the muscle be, to be polarized. It might be another nerve. It's possible. And what we also learned, I thought this was very interesting, is that electrical signals can go both directions. <coughs> if this is, was an, a nerve and not a muscle, then it could, it could reverb. We also know that synaptic transmission is nearly instantaneous. I believe 1.1 1 .1 millisecond. Remember, 1 millisecond is 1,000th of a second. 0.1 millisecond is would be another order of, of 10. <coughs> Less than that, this explains your ultra-fast karate moves. Bam! All these years you didn't know why you're so cool. EPSP and IPSP. Let's talk about that for just a minute. Let's talk for just a minute about EPSPs and IPSPs. Excitatory postsynaptic potentials and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. There are, there is an ability to preload a synapse for a transmission. And then there's an ability to inhibit, preload, and inhibit a transmission at a synapse. Very interesting. When we talk about the receptors that are on the effector, there are a couple of different classifications, ionotropic and metabotropic receptors. Ionotropic receptors would be sensitive to ion changes. Sodium is one of the ones that goes inside and causes an action potential. And so that, in my mind, would kind of imply an electrochemical change happening. Metabotropic is a little bit frustrating for me. And uh, the reason I'm having trouble with it is it, it is as a result of metabolism. But I want to say that it might be a hormone. And that this hormone is unlocking the outside of a cell. And then there is a second messenger system that gets kicked in, cyclic A and P. To help move the signal to the nucleus uh, to initiate DNA transcription and some kind of response to this hormone. I have already said before that acetylcholine is the main neurotransmitter that we have associated with muscles and therefore it is called a cholinergic synapse. Another class of neurotransmitter is the catecholamine. It is made out of the amino acid tyrosine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter oftentimes that is the main neurotransmitter mimicked or engaged the receptor site engaged in addiction. This would be something that would bring relief or pleasure a lot of times. And one of the things that we learned as well is that in schizophrenia, which is a nerve system disorder, that these people have too much dopamine. We learned also that when we talk about anxiety, depression, that serotonin is another neurotransmitter. We learned that GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, is another neurotransmitter involved in anxiety, depression. Interestingly enough, in bipolar, a sodium channel block, a sodium channel is associated with bipolar. Interesting. There are a couple of different interesting circuits that the nerve system employs, and one of them is a, di a diverging circuit. There might be an initiation in a neuron that then splits into multiple neurons, in this case, maybe to control multiple muscle fibers so that a bigger action can be the result of this small initiated impulse. That's kind of cool. This is a very comprehensive and a difficult topic. Keep studying on it. I keep studying on it, and the more I study, the more I learn. It's highly intriguing. I think brain science is one of the new frontiers. We get kind of hung up on moonshots and going to Mars, but I think one of the new adventure places is going to be the brain and uh, one of the things that I'm learning about right now is that some researchers 
are trying to figure out how to use jellyfish genes, glow-in-the-dark genes, to create impulses that can be zeros and ones signals to turn neurons, fire neurons, turn them on and off, store memory. So it may be possible one day that memories can be uploaded and downloaded and, you know, kind of like a matrix thing. So stay tuned.